Okay, so a little bit about our presenter today, Adam Lewinberg. He is the president of Postal Advocate, the only mail audit and recovery firm in the U.S. and Canada. We manage a portfolio of over 160,000 pieces of mailing and shipping equipment for the largest U.S. companies. He speaks and teaches nationally on mail savings and industry trends. He is the former industry co-chair for the Boston Postal Customer Council and a member of the Mail Systems Management Association with certifications of CMDSS, and MDC. He's a featured writer for Mailing Systems Technology Magazine. He also worked for one of the largest mailing vendors for over 17 years as the Director of National Sales for Presort, Tabletop Inserters, Addressing Hardware, Software, and Green Offerings. He was also one of the top five account managers nationally working with some of the nation's largest accounts. Postal Advocate is not affiliated with any mailing of vendors, so we offer unbiased advice. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Doris. So today we're going to talk about the top 10 ways to optimize your USPS permanent account. So, you know, this is maybe not the most exciting of all topics to people, but because of that, it often gets overlooked. And But when a category like this gets overlooked, there's savings in it that people typically miss. And we're going to go through how you can manage this in a much easier way and how you can find savings inside of what you're doing that typically we find get missed. So we're going to talk about USPS Business Customer Gateway, um, it's a, there's new tools that the post office has to make your online experience much easier to interact with them. They have a new electronic payment system that makes it easier to pay for things versus running around with checks. You know, I'm sure people have memories of those uh, from certain past dealings. There's an enterprise PO box online system where you can consolidate your PO box payments, and we'll talk about that. Consolidating your locations into master permits. There's a lot of savings in doing that, as well as some visibility advantages. How to analyze your permanent accounts for maximum savings. So where do you get savings from these? What, do you, what to look for? Um, managing your funding levels to make sure that you're not sitting on hordes of cash sitting in permits that you know, are unused, maybe for accounts that aren't even used anymore. How do you schedule regular reviews and audits of this? How do you manage your account in confirming that you've gotten your refunds from these accounts? There's, there's millions of dollars that goes gets lost in permit accounts every year. And then centralizing the sort of the permit management in many organizations, it's totally decentralized around the country, you know, handled by different departments and groups with no sort of central visibility. So what's entailed in that and, and what are the benefits? And then, you know, an important one that we think is knowing your USPS contact is, is having someone at the USPS you can go to at a local level to get the sort of support that you need. So the USPS Customer Gateway. So you can manage your entire USPS relationship through one portal. It's so much easier than it used to be. You can create accounts and permits. You can manage your activity. You can produce reports. You can create business reply mail envelope templates. So if you want to set up new business reply mail accounts. The post office offers incentives every quarter if you're doing different things, usually geared on increasing mail volumes or doing transpromotional items or you know, changing around the way that you do your mail. You get to see all those in one place. And then they have a ton of educational information. So to give you sort of a snapshot, this is a, a picture from one of our um, EPS, one of our um, gateway accounts that we're managing for a client. And you can see that these are the mailing and shipping services that are available. And it's pretty much the majority of things that you need to do when interacting with a post office. And you can literally go to every piece. So do you want to manage your business reply mail, the balances in your postage accounts? Every, if you do every door direct mail, what are the incentive programs? You know, if you need to create mailer IDs, you know, we don't need to go through each one of these things. But the important part is to see that it's all right here. And if you're doing a lot of shipping services from them, you know, you could see that everything's there from if you want to use their free click and ship services to managing your balances in your accounts to your managing your permits. So it's all in one place. But if you don't, if you haven't used it, I strongly recommend that you do, and it'll make managing your permits significantly easier. Inside this, inside the gateway, there's an electronic, an enterprise payment system, and the enterprise payment system creates a payment linkage to fund all of your accounts in one place. So versus needing, like, you know, everyone remembers a story of, oh my God, I need to create, cut a check and I need to run it down to a local post office to pay for a PO box or a business reply mail that's been sitting there. You know, those stories just, you know, create bad taste in people's mouths about dealing with the post office. Now it's just so easy through this one enterprise payment system, you can pay and manage all the services online in a single account. Um, it's a self-service customer experience. 
uh, enhanced security features with centralized balance management. You can fund through ACH debit or trust accounts. They even have a mobile check deposit like you would use in your personal bank where you could take a picture of a check and it can automatically deposit into the account. There's no manual application form submitted to CAPS and it's, you know, I think it's pretty intuitive and interactive. I've, I've listed the services that are supported through an enterprise payment system and those that aren't. The most common classes that people use for regular business mail today, you know, are the ones I highlighted in yellow. So first class mail, letters, flats, and cards, USPS marketing mail, periodicals, business reply mail, every door direct, PO boxes. Those are the most common services that people use, and they're all supported through this. Most of the services not supported, but you can only support through CAPS, are ones that you know are more niche that not every mailer is really using for their day-to-day -day mail. Most services, because the post office is trying to push everyone to EPS, are included here. Now, PO boxes is something that most organizations, frankly, we find are in a total mess. They manage PO boxes scattered throughout the organization. They're funding those and managing them at individual post offices where they're coordinating them with. There's not a lot of visibility of the size of the boxes and the fees in which they're spending. So now the post office has an enterprise PO box online system, EPOBOL, what a fun acronym they've created. So, so what this does is it allows you to manage open, close, view, pay fees, and renew all PO boxes, um, caller and reserve services for all your locations from a single application and get electronic notifications for your renewals. So commercial mailers can pay for this using an ACH debit account and it's all connected to a centralized service. So you know, if you've done PO box work in the past, you know that it can be painful with the forms and interacting with the different post offices. Now it can all be done in one place online through central payments and renewals can be managed at once. And so this should make people's lives significantly easier. So what we recommend is consolidating your locations into master permits. So what this does is it eliminates the annual fees you have to pay. And the fees can be expensive. You know, as an example, we have a client who has 100 business reply accounts. And so each account is paying, was paying $240 a year, which is the current you know, uh, annual permit fee for their accounts. We consolidated them into a master account. Now they pay one $240 fee for all 100 business reply accounts. So it can eliminate significant amounts of fees. Paying one permit fee for all locations is significantly easier. Um, it provides better central visibility for you to be able to see with, you know, with ease and export all of your, you know, all the transactions that are going from those permits. Simplified funding, it's certainly easier to fund one permit than it is to fund a hundred of them that are on separate. And the funds can all be pulled from one uh, enterprise payment system account. And it can be done through an ACH connection. And um, everyone should have a story about the difficulties of funding these types of accounts. The way it would typically work is you would have, you'd create a main permit account, like one, two, three, four, zero, zero, zero. And maybe that was out of Boston. Then there'd be an actual per, a business reply account or permit account that Boston would use, like one, two, three, four, dash, five, two, six. And then Los Angeles could have the same number, dash 527, or Chicago could have 528. And then on the export, it will give you those numbers along with the city. So even if they were to share the same exact permit number, it would say the city that the money's coming out of. So you'd be able to track it back to its end use. But much easier and significant savings around it. USPS Mail Anywhere program. So what this, so with outbound mail, um, it used to be like the biggest challenge that comes in is you do, you're in Boston, let's say, as an example, and you use a mail house in Columbus, Ohio, and then use another mail house that's in Seattle, and maybe another mail house or another mail service, or you have a location that's, that's doing mailings that's in Cleveland. So in the previous scenario, you had to have permits set up in each one of those offices where you had to pay the fees and manage the balances and things like that. With mail anywhere, you can have one permit that would say Boston, Massachusetts, permit number one, two, three, that could fund all, that could be used for all of those areas and it, making it so much easier to manage, track, and then set up. So it gives you greater flexibility because you can manage the production of where it needs to be versus having to set up all these random permits wherever you are. You can maintain one locally held permit for your mailings nationally. The same permit number sitting in state can be printed on the piece 
and entered at any location. The permit imprint fees are waived at each location. The annual pre-sort fees are only required if the customer falls below 90% full service requirements. You do need to be on IMB in full service with this, in doing full service, um, but it is the way that the post office is gearing everyone for the future anyway. There are some eligi elig eligibility requirements. Um, we've included the link to Postal Pro if you have questions. Everyone will get a copy of this presentation. So I would recommend if this is something you're interested in looking at it. But I just want, we're gonna talk more about lost funds in the future. But one of the biggest areas where people lose permit money is the fact that they've had to over the years fund permits in local areas where the mail services they used were located. So that example of the Cleveland and the Columbus and the, and the Seattle, you used to have to just literally have a permit in those offices just to support a third party mail house running your mail. And those types of permits, if the job switched and vendors changed, um, often got forgotten about. So this should hopefully make it easier. So now let's talk about the savings. The savings come in the ability by having these things centralized, by having them on a gateway and central visibility to them, and being able to export out the activity on a regular basis. We get to find areas of savings that, that most organizations miss. And so let's talk about what those things are. For outbound permits, the question is, are you getting the lowest rate, the, the biggest area of savings? So for anyone who's not familiar about postage rules, I'm just gonna give a quick, quick one-on-one. The way postage discounts work, is it's based on the density of the sortation level. So when you, the five digit rate is the, is the most dense. It means that you have at least 150 pieces going to a specific zip code. Let's use 90210 in California. So if I, and if I have 150 pieces or more going to 90210, I get a rate of 38.9 cents for first class mail. If I don't have 150 pieces, do I have 150 pieces going to an automated area distribution center that would go, that would support maybe 902, 904, and 906, a schematic of three digit zip codes the post office gives us. And then that would qualify for a rate of 41.9 cents. And then basically all my residual pieces go for 43.9 cents. And then if I use, there's a very basic manual pre-sort rate that you can use if you didn't have barcodes and it's 46 cents. So the point is a lot of mailings are going at, you know, different rate structures based on the kind of densities that you have. So are your mailings going at the lowest rates? Are you getting five digit and AADC rates for them? And if you're not, or if there's a good chunk of your mail that isn't, could you be using a third party pre-sort service that could pick your mail up and get you those types of rates based on your volumes? And could those pre-sort services maybe get you a better rate for all of the mailings versus you trying to sort it on your own? Or for just the stuff that you weren't getting high density rates on before? Um, another strategy is if you're doing a lot of marketing mailing, you know, by being able to see it, are you using destination entry discounts? What the way destination entry discounts work for marketing mail is if you can physically move the mail closer to the DNDC or the DSCF, you get extra savings per piece, two cents to 2.6 cents on letters. For flats, it's four to five cents. And if it's heavier items, 17 to 21 cents by just moving the piece closer to its destination. It may make sense to have a service that can do this. By having visibility to where these mailings are, it gives you visibility to say, would these types of services potentially make sense? Or could we just sort them deeper like we did with first class mail? But you can't do that if you don't have the visibility to all the mailings. You can't make those decisions. Then also, are current paid permits being used? So what we find in a lot of cases is people are paying annual permit fees for permits that they've had for years that they put on autopilot, but no one's actually using anymore and they should be canceled. And some of those permits may have funds on them that could be redeemed. So by having this visibility, it gives you the ability to manage this and make sure that, um, that everything's in one place and that you're maximizing your savings. Another area that's often overlooked and th that can have you know, even larger savings opportunities is business reply mail. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of um, basics on how business reply mail fees are structured. So you have an annual permit fee of basically $240 a year. And then based on the type of account, you might have an annual account maintenance fee. And if you pay for high volume accounts, high volume QBRM, basic or high volume, you pay a 725 fee per year. If you use QBRM high volume, you also pay a 2460 quarterly fee. So you can see the total fees per account range from 240 to $10,565. But depending on the fees and the way you've structured your account, 
the per piece rate for the items getting returned go down. So if you don't pay any of the account maintenance fees or quarterly fees, it costs you 85 cents to get a piece back. With business reply mail, you're only paying for the pieces that get physically returned to you. So you pay 85 cents. If you have a high volume account, that goes down to 9.3 cents. A, quite a significant difference, 85 cents to 9.3 cents. And then it goes qualified business reply 7.2 or 1.5 cents if it's QBRM high volume. And then the postage rate goes down. So if you have the basic accounts, you pay 55 cents to get that piece back in the postage side, and then 53.4 if you use QBRM. So you have to look at the total cost, fee and postage, of $1.40 at the basic level down to 54.9 cents for the QBRM. And so what you have to look at with, excuse me, what you have to look at with, QB, with business reply mail is how many returns are you physically getting a year? If you do less than 611 returns a year, you're better off having a basic account. If you have, you know, if you're over 611, you should consider, you know, having um, high volume QBRM basic or QBM high volume. So um, let's look at a couple examples. And these examples, you know, we find at like the majority of accounts that we're working with around managing their business reply accounts. So let's say someone has 50,000 returns per year. If they have 50,000 returns, they're spending $70,000 if the account's set up at a basic level. But if it's a high volume account, they're spending 33,000. It's a $37,000 savings on that. That account might've been set up years ago, was put on autopilot at the basic level and no one thought twice about it. But they could have reduced their cost by 53%. Let's take another scenario. They have a high volume account. They've been paying the $725 fee every year, but they only get 250 returns back. And so it's costing them 1126 versus 590. So it's, you know, basically there's a 48% savings opportunity. And another example is, let's say you have a huge volume, you're getting 500,000 returns back and you're just set up as high volume. Well, you should certainly be set up as QBRM because it would save you $37,000 a year. The, big, the other thing that we find is oftentimes there are a lot of BRM accounts that people are paying for on an annual basis but the usage is either in like the single digits or they haven't used them in years and people are still paying it. So it's a good idea to find savings requires that you get the visibility to these accounts. and You know where all of your spends are in one place so you can make these informed decisions because these volumes change over time. Which is exactly, which is a good lead into don't put your accounts on autopilot. This needs a review, either monthly or quarterly. We're reviewing this monthly for our accounts. And we're looking for things like, are the funding levels correct? You know, are annual fees being paid? Are all accounts being used? If not, we should be closing them. Um, are the charges being allocated back to departments or groups that generate them? So, you know, most companies charge back postage and it's important to know if these, if, that there's a process for doing that. Are the lowest postage costs being utilized like we talked about? What trends are happening? Are the volumes in, the, in these permit accounts, are they growing, are they decreasing? And are there USPS promotional incentives that can help further reduce costs? But if you don't have the visibility to it, you can't manage it. And if you're not looking at this on a regular basis, you're missing these things. And that's why permanent accounts have to be managed. And also to put it in another perspective, for many organizations, the permit postage accounts are the largest spends of postage because they're funding the largest projects. You know, you might look at the postage metering expense that you have that's going through metering accounts that might get some visibility. But oftentimes the permits are being funded to do hum huge projects done through third party entities that, you know, that can be two, three, five, ten times more than people are spending on metered accounts. Yet most organizations have less visibility to it. Manage your funding levels. So the question is, do you know the balance in all your USPS permits? And is this balance, does this balance that you have sitting there tie into a typical usage level? Is it, you know, an amount that you would use on a, on a monthly basis? You know, and how often are these balances reviewed? Some organizations are gonna have a direct link to their account and it's funding on a regular basis. Maybe it's even daily, they're doing polls, you know, or, the, or, or that night, you know, to pull real time. That's a great, that's a great um, process that people have set up. But most organizations fund large sums into the accounts at one point in time, and then the money sits there. The post office is a bank. People don't often think of it that way. They think of it as expense. And this is the large, the biggest reasons that we see funds getting lost is when most people send in a check for $20,000 or they, they wire $20,000 to the post office, 
they're expensing the $20,000 of postage funds at the time they send it to the Postal Service. In, in actuality, that $20,000 is a bank account that you're, you've just funded, and you have a $20,000 asset that's sitting in a post office bank for you. Um, when you look at, if you, if you look at it as an expense and the money's gone, you know, businesses don't track the expense to the same level, and that's how funds get lost. So are all of your accounts connected to an ACH or do you require checks being sent in? And then are the annual fees being paid through the account or are they billed separately? Some accounts we see the annual fees are automatically deducted and then other accounts we see the annual fees are paid separately and they're physically people are cutting checks um, at their local post office to fund them. So the question is how are these funding levels managed and it's an important part to watch out for in your permanent account. Don't assume you're getting refunds from closed permanent accounts. We have led the research on this, and I want to tell you sort of our findings on this so you can sort of get a sense of it. We, we're trying to think of what happens to lost postage. You know, there's tons of meters that get turned in, you know, offices that are closed, merged in through acquisitions. You know, are people getting their funds back? So we started doing, we've been doing research on this for about six years now. We found 53,000 lost Pitney Bowes transactions turned over to 15 states as unclaimed property. Pitney Bowes is the only vendor um, in the postal world that actually will turn the funds over to the states as unclaimed property so you can get the money back. The other two mailing vendors don't turn the funds over because the money is held in USPS accounts and, you, and the USPS never turns funds over to the states. They make you have to work directly through the USPS to get those funds. We did multiple Freedom of Information Act requests to the post office to get the information. We had multiple meetings with different USPS account managers um, in management with no good answers that we got back. We wrote a January 14th cover article for Mailing Systems Technology exposing this. Has the Postal Service been holding millions of dollars? This article prompted the USPS Inspector General to do a whole research project where they, they found that the post office was doing an improper practice and they should change their processes of how they notify clients wrote a further article on January 15, describing the findings from that uh, Inspector General office, and have had subsequent meetings with Inspector General and with the Post Office asking for changes to happen in these, of which there's been no response. So let's talk about what happens to your permanent account. If you have a permanent account, after two years of inactivity, the Post Office will send you one letter, and this letter will say, come down to the Post Office where you originally took out the funds within 60 days, and they will, um, otherwise they're gonna transfer those funds to a different general ledger account and they're gonna consider it income in the year in which they turn it over. No future notifications will ever be sent to you. Um, the other bad part about it is the, the letter that they send to you after the two years of inactivity will be sent to the original person and the original address that the permit was taken out. That person, if there was a closure, if there's business consolidations, that person may not be there, the office may no longer be there, and this is what causes this loss. But no future notifications would be sent. Every other loss fund in the country gets turned over to the state's unclaimed funds office, except the postal transaction. So you can get your money in the future if you, if you wanna get it, but you, it's, it's upon you. The post office will never notify you or publish in any list that you had funds available. So money can be redeemed by you having proof of the account. We estimate there's $200 million in lost permit funds that have been lost since 2000 based on, on the, the information from the Inspector General's office and you know, the transitions that have happened in the business world you know, from the mergers and consolidations over the years and especially that there's a ton of postage out there. We do this type of recovery for accounts and we're always amazed by how much we find. So how do you search for your money? So build a listing of your current and past permit numbers. This can be done, we recommend going to your accounts payable records where you had past expenses, working with your USPS account managers and requesting lists of permits. Andy, enter any permit accounts into the USPS business gateway and see what details can be found. Reach out to your local postmasters of closed permits to see what they have available. And then once the funds have been identified, fill out a form PS um, form 3533 application for refund of fees. Um, and you can get your money back. So that's the process. There's money out there. If you need help in this, you know, we certainly can help you on some of the claims process and identifying these funds, but there's money out there in every organization, especially larger ones, is gonna have funds that they've lost in this manner. 
do's and don'ts. Do not have permits managed through your field locations. Wherever possible, centralize the management of this. When you have funds managed through your field locations, funds get lost, there's lack of oversight to it, um, there's usually lack of expertise, large value of funds. This can be the largest postal spends that we talked, we talked about in an organization. When you have change of business personnel and closed offices, it leads to loss. There's been an incredible amount of acquisition and divestitures over the years. It creates an amazing amount of confusion with these funds and they get forgotten about. Many permits are for mailings done by third parties, the outside organizations, so you lose the visibility of those. Postage rules are confusing, and the new tools can make, an, make this process easy. You know, it's very simple to consolidate all this, to at least have a central visibility tool. Even if it's not paid directly and centrally, they can still use the, um, the gateway to just create the visibility to where all this stuff is. The biggest issue about this is, as mail volumes have gone down, and as people in the mailing community have basically retired, there's a lack of expertise around mail in most organizations. And so when you manage these things in the field, that you just don't have the oversight and the expertise to be able to, to, to know that these things are being managed properly. We recommend having a core contact at the USPS that can help you with these things when you run into questions. So, you need someone to guide you through without needing to call the 800 number. When you call the 800 number, you can get answers, but it's not always the answers you need, and it's not always you know, at the specificity that is required. So there should be someone that you work with at a local level that is familiar with your account. So to find that person, here are some tips that we recommend. Talk to your local postmaster, see who they recommend. Reach out to the mailing requirements group at the closest bulk mail center. Ask who supports the closest metro, major metropolitan area for business accounts. So, you know, if, you know if, if you're in the suburbs of a city, like find out, look at the major city that supports you and you can reach out to that, you know, customer business center. There's also, I was the, the, the co-chair of the Boston Postal Customer Council, which is an industry and postal customer like, council. They're everywhere in the country. There's at least, you know, 100 um, postal customer councils throughout the country. They're in every city. And they can help you. You know, there'll be a, on each of their websites, there'll be a board of directors. And there's, you should be able to reach out to anyone on the board of directors list, whether they're postal or whether they're industry. And they'll be able to put you in touch with someone that can help you. But use these tools to find people because one of the hardest parts of the postal service is finding the right people that can help you in your account. The largest accounts might, be, have, might have dedicated sales account managers, but the mid-size accounts and down typically won't. So you have to fight to find your own resources. So in summary, the USPS has come out with a lot of new tools to make managing these permits easier. And hopefully you can see the visibility that's there is incredible compared to what it used to be, which was very limited. Funding could be done centrally and electronically for all permits and PO boxes. There's no need to run around to the post office cutting checks and scrambling to get funds. Permits can be consolidated to master accounts for ease of payment. In some cases, single permits can be used nationally. There's significant savings around outbound permit and business reply accounts to make sure that they're set up right at the right levels and that you're maximizing the savings on each one. There's clearly a benefit of proactive versus reactive permit management to ensure that you're getting the savings that you need. The funding levels is important. The last thing you want is tens of thousands of dollars sitting in inactive permit accounts when you can get those funds back to be used for more pressing issues. Request refunds for dormant accounts. You don't want things sitting out there because they will get lost and the post office will not help you get them past a certain point. Um, centralized versus decentralized, hopefully you can see there's benefits to having decentralized permit management and control. And you know, try to find dedicated USPS account managers that can help you answer questions and manage your account. These, these might not be something that you have in your core job requirement or that there's a person in your organization to do. You know, if you need help, we do this for organizations. We do all these things. We set up this webinar as educational based. So hopefully, we hopefully gave you the tools to be able to do this on your own. But if you don't feel that you have the, either the time, the resources, or the expertise internally to do this, we, you know, we can help you do it. And if you need it, please feel free to reach out to us. So all that we do is help customers manage their mailing spends. We saved our clients over $61 million since we started in 2012, basically. We 
average 58% savings, at least on the equipment side of it. The equipment side is one of our core areas where we've been able to be really successful for our clients. And we manage a fleet of 160,000 pieces of mailing equipment um, throughout our, our clients in the US and Canada. It's the largest mailing fleet in the world, bigger than the federal government. We're helping multi-location manage their accounts. We've recovered $16 million in lost postage, vendor fees, and overcharges for our accounts. And um, our average client savings has been $1.6 million. On our team, we have 175 years of industry experience. We provide web tools that, you know, where we're consolidating data from multiple places into a dashboard that we make available for our clients. So it makes it easier. And then we provide time savings and assistance where we're managing the fleet and we're their go-to people for managing this category. Our clients are every industry. You know, we work with eight of the top 15 banks, three of the top 10 insurance companies, one of the top two pharmacies. It doesn't really matter about the, the industry that a client's in. What really matters is that they're large organizations with diverse fleets of locations and equipment. And you know, what we do for just about any client is we'll do an analysis for them to show them what savings are available. And then you know, if they decide to move forward after the analysis, then we'll go submit the vendor request for savings and negotiate pricing catalogs. And then the majority of it is work with your end users on managing this category. We present all savings to you for approval. We don't approve anything. And we manage it on a web dashboard and we provide ongoing support. And the ongoing support is the most important thing because very few organizations have all of their stuff coming up at one point in time. It's usually an ongoing area over a period of years based on contract renewal cycles. So we're here to support our clients and you know, we, you know, hopefully you can see from the level of detail that we got in here that we provide that same level of detail for our clients. So we believe in education. We have different webinars running throughout the year. Um, we have probably about six to seven different webinars that we're running. Past webinars are all on our website. So you can go to postaladvocate.com and you could see excerpts of past webinars. We're having another webinar coming June 17th, how to save money on carrier management services across your enterprise. We're gonna be diving into different ways that you can reduce costs on your UPS, FedEx, DHL, and post office package and overnight management and how you can distribute postage and shipping management throughout a large organization. So if they're interested in that, please feel free to use our website as a resource guide. Um, and you know, these webinars are all free because we think education is you know, really needed in our industry and we're here to promote it. So I wanna open it up to any questions. Hopefully that answered a lot. You know, hopefully it gave you some visibility to things to think about at least around permit spends and some of the opportunities that are available. So I'm gonna open it up for any questions. Thank you, Adam. Just as a quick reminder, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can ask your question, or if, you have an, or if you're not comfortable talking um, to the group, you can also put it in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer all questions today. Okay, first question, How uh, will we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, um, there is a post webinar email that will go out that will also provide a link to the actual presentation as well as a copy of the, a link to the webinar recording. Uh, next question, how do you link all business reply accounts together? So typically you'll set up a master account at one hub post office um, and they will create a number for that. And then you make sure that you get artwork done so you can have, you know, through the gateway so you can have envelopes basically distributed out and you would create sub accounts right from the gateway um, for all of the sub offices that you have. And then you'd want to distribute those, you know, have those envelopes printed and distributed, but then everything can be managed centrally. You probably, if you have different business reply accounts around the country, you'd probably want to set up new ones that are geared towards this new master account because you're going to have to have different envelopes printed. So it basically comes back to the right place. But it's pretty straightforward. And, you know, it, I mean, it takes a little bit of time to get it done. But once it's done, you know, it makes life a lot easier. Thank you. Uh, next question. How do you know where all your permits are? Sure. It's not easy in a lot of organizations. We've found, you know, when we're trying to pull together a client's mailing spend, what we do typically is we'll find out, are there any like 
you know, gateway or CAPS accounts or anything that people know about today. And we'll get some information that way. But the most effective way is we'll go to their accounts payable system and we'll find, we'll do a search on different names that a post office could come up with, which would be things like United States Postal Service, USPS, Postmaster, you know, think how you might register the post office as a vendor inside your system. And we'll do a search for a period of time to, you know, usually going back at least a year, but hopefully a few years to find out where there were payments made to the Postal Service that are larger than $200, which would either indicate a mailing or a permit fee or something like that. And that would give us the, the visibility to where these permits are throughout the country. And then from there, we may need, you know, a copy of an invoice to see like a little bit more detail than comes in accounts payable in the accounts payable system. But it, at least that would gear us to where these permits are. And then from there, we could get linkage or, you know, you could, we could help link them to the gateway or you could link them yourself. But that's typically the way we do it is using the accounts payable as a way to find all these things. The checks are usually cut to the post office for any permits in which you're managing. Other questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for being on this call. If there's any future questions you guys have or we can provide any services, please let us know. And um, we appreciate you all being on the call. I just want to make sure there's no other calls. Um, oh, there's a question that got typed. Hold on. Does the USPS mail anywhere require um, that? The, hold on a second. I'm just trying a hard time. Okay, here we go. Um, require that um, all, does the USPS mail anywhere require that there's a pre sort company that serves all the sites? Um, no, it doesn't. It requires that you have the the permit set up um, and it's registered to you and um, you can decide who you give that permit to, but it, it allows, whether it's a free sort site or a mail house, to be able to use that permit. It's, it's who you sort of dictate uses that permit. But it doesn't have to be the same free sort company or anything like that that services all your sites. It could be multiple different companies that you give that permit, you give that um, that mail anywhere account to. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for being on the call and please let us know if any questions come up or if there's anything we can do to help. Have a nice afternoon.